Coniston Water in England's Lake District on the 4th of January 1967. Donald Campbell was going for the world water speed record in his jet-powered boat, Bluebird. The weather had been bad. Bluebird had been plagued by mechanical faults. Work on the boat had been conducted under a makeshift tarpaulin stretched between two poles. An air of deep gloom had descended on Campbell's loyal team, as clammy as the winter mist clinging to the surrounding hills. The press waited for the endlessly delayed record bid. At Christmas, Campbell had sent his team away to their families. He was left alone at Coniston to make a couple of trial runs in Bluebird with local support. When his engineer, Leo Villa, returned, he chided Campbell for taking such a risk with no qualified rescue team at hand. Campbell told him fatalistically, it's doubtful if the rescue boat could get to me in time if anything did happen. On the 4th of January, the weather improved, sufficiently to make a record attempt possible. Everyone assembled at dawn. Leo Villa told Campbell, it doesn't look too bad, Skipper. In a strangely detached way, the normally ebullient Campbell asked Villa to get everyone to their stations. At 8.42 a.m., Bluebird's engines roared into life. The record attempt was on. As Campbell passed Leo Villa, Bluebird was rock steady. In the distance, Villa saw the plume of spray, which meant that Campbell had applied the water brake. Normally, Campbell would have radioed to check that his wake had settled for his second run. But all Campbell wanted to know was his speed. It had been 297 miles per hour. To Villa's alarm, Campbell announced, stand by, I'm making my second run. He risked hitting the turbulence of his first, which could lift the bows, causing Bluebird to take off. But mystery still shrouds the death of Donald Campbell. Complete accident, I'm afraid, over. Donald Campbell was born to break world speed records. His father was the remarkable Sir Malcolm Campbell, in his heyday, the fastest man on earth. Donald was born in 1921. A year later, at Saltburn in Yorkshire, his father made his first attempt on the world land speed record driving a 350 horsepower sunbeam christened Bluebird, the first of many. The record finally fell to Campbell on Pendine Sands in Wales in July 1925. In the process, he became the first man to drive at 150 miles per hour. By now, Battle Royal had been joined for the land speed record. In the late 1920s, Campbell fought a seesawing contest with his rivals, Sir Henry Seagrave and J.G. Parry Thomas, pushing the record ever higher. In 1927, Parry Thomas' chain-driven Hyam special crashed and killed him at Pendine Sands.
Babs, as the car had been christened, was buried on the beach. Forty years later, it was dug up and restored. In 1927, Sir Henry Seagrave had broken through the 200 mile per hour barrier on land. In 1930, in Miss England too, he attempted to break the 100 mile per hour barrier on water. Tragedy ensued. The boat hit a submerged lock. Seagrave and one of his engineers drowned. The day was Friday the 13th. Malcolm Campbell surged on. In February 1932, at Daytona Beach in Florida, he clambered aboard a new and even more powerful bluebird. Hurtling along the treacherous beach, littered with seashells, Campbell pushed the record up to 253 miles per hour. A knighthood and a hero's welcome awaited Campbell in Britain. Donald and his mother were on the quayside as the liner berthed. For Donald, the triumph and the tragedy of his own record-breaking attempts lay 30 years ahead. Thanks, old boy. I'm delighted to get back, old chap. Delighted. We, uh, conditions over there went too good. Rough beach and very bad visibility. And it was absolutely useless tying again because owing to the storms that uh, swept the coast of Florida, it wasn't likely that they'd ever get better. And therefore we backed off and came back as quick as we possibly could. Campbell was now at the height of his fame. Hawk-faced, autocratic and mercilessly demanding of his brilliant engineer, Leo Villa. By 1935, he had set his sights on the 300 mile per hour mark. Campbell had abandoned Daytona Beach for the blinding white salt flats at Bonneville in Utah. For the attempt on the record, in September 1935, he was accompanied for the first time by Donald, now 14 years old. As ever, Sir Malcolm was supremely confident. In Utah, the supercharged Bluebird survived a burst tire on the first run to set a new record of 301 miles per hour. Well, Dad, I'm mighty glad you reached the 300, but I felt sure you'd do it. Right, old chap, I'm, I'm very pleased too. But I reckon you've had a real good time whilst you've been over here in the States, because everybody's been so awfully kind to you, haven't they? They sure have. Now 50, Sir Malcolm decided to become the fastest man on water. His newest Bluebird was powered by the same Rolls-Royce aero engine which had taken him past 300 miles per hour on land. On Italy's Lake Maggiore, in 1937, it took him to a world-beating 129 miles per hour. By 1939, he had raised the record to just under 142 miles per hour on Coniston water. Donald was now a young man, living in the shadow of his famous father. Post-war jobs in the city and light engineering were far removed from Sir Malcolm's swashbuckling achievements. Sir Malcolm would brook no rivals in the family and did everything he could to dissuade Donald from following in his footsteps. His father had cast a long shadow over Donald's life. His death in 1949 might have released Donald from the heavy burden. Paradoxically, it set him on a course for which nature had not fashioned him. He believed he had a lot to live up to and was determined to follow in Sir Malcolm's footsteps. I worship father. He was a very great, dynamic, colorful man with a tremendous foresight. His courage was outstanding. I think the greatest example I ever had from him was in 1935. There was a schoolboy with him on the Bonneville Salt Flats in Utah when he was the first man to reach 300. And on that first run, one of the Dunlop Towers, the right-hand front one, had burst at 300 miles an hour as the car left the measured mile. And I will never forget, at the end of that run, seeing the old man by the side of that car, gaunt and silent. And I tried to talk to him and then suddenly realized this was the wrong thing to do. The wrong thing, because I was sure in his own mind that he thought that on his return run, he was going to be killed. But that didn't daunt him, and it didn't in any way affect his resolution. On the day his father's effects were being auctioned, 
Donald Campbell heard that an American, Henry Kaiser, had announced that he was going to recapture the world water speed record for America. Even though he had never sat behind the wheel of a racing car, let alone that of a high-speed boat, Donald Campbell decided that he would keep the record in Britain. He enlisted the help of Leo Villa, bought Bluebird from his father's executors, replaced its jet engine with a Rolls-Royce piston engine, and seven months later arrived at Coniston to make his first unsuccessful attempt on the water speed record. Sir Malcolm had left Donald little of his money, but he had inherited the old man's determination. It was an inheritance which would cost him his life. Always jaunty on the surface, Donald Campbell was a driven man. The devil-may-care image masked the inner anxieties which tugged at him throughout his career, and the strains were made worse by the constant need to raise money for each new attempt. In 1950, Donald made his second attempt on the water speed record. Bad weather disrupted his plans. He went home empty-handed, and with the knowledge that the American, Stanley Sayers, had raised the record by over 20 miles per hour. The son of a great national hero had failed to prove himself. The press wrote him off, but they had reckoned without his family's stubborn streak. A new prop-riding bluebird was built. In 1951, she was taken to Lake Garda to race and then to Coniston for another shot at the record. On a practice run, she hit some surface debris and sank. At this point, another man might have given up. Two years of hard work and risk had produced nothing. Campbell had kissed goodbye to most of his money. In September 1952, he had also lost a lifelong friend and rival, John Carp, who died when his jet-powered boat, Crusader, crashed while travelling at over 200 miles per hour on Loch Ness. Spectators noticed one or two slight variations in Cobb's course before Crusader dived and vanished in a cloud of smoke. In February 1955, a new all-metal jet-powered bluebird fitted with two planing floats was unveiled at Alswater in the Lake District. In July, Donald Campbell took her through the 200 mile per hour water barrier. There was triumph for Campbell and his wife Dorothy then agony over a timekeeping quibble. And finally, confirmation that, as Donald told the press, he was the man who passed water faster than anyone else in the world. Later that same year, he took Bluebird to Lake Mead in Nevada, where he raised the record by another 14 miles per hour. His progress was not entirely smooth, at one point, Bluebird made a determined effort to sink, but was towed to shallow water and salvaged. After several more attempts on Lake Coniston, Campbell's record was approaching 250 miles per hour. Each yearly increment, scrupulously recorded by the timekeepers, gained Campbell a substantial cash prize, which then financed the next effort and kept his devoted team together. Donald had also married again. His new bride was Tonya Burr, a former nightclub singer. In May 1959, Bluebird took to the water again at Lake Coniston. This time, Campbell was clocked at 260 miles per hour. He 
had virtually made the water speed record his own. Even as he collected the big cup, Donald Campbell's ambitions were turning towards the land speed record and a new car. Which will deliver an effective power of nearly 5,000 horsepower with the express the intention of pushing the world's land speed record to beyond 400 miles per hour. The car was rolled out in May 1960. The streamlined CN7 Bluebird was powered by a Bristol Siddeley Proteus engine developing 5,000 horsepower at 11,000 revolutions per minute. Her idling speed, with no throttle at all, was 180 miles per hour. Everything looked good for Campbell at Bonneville where his father had been the first man to break the 300 mile per hour barrier 25 years before. But the surface of the Salt Lake was no longer hard and dazzling. In the intervening years, it had become gray, damp and unstable. On a trial run, it led to a crash at a speed approaching 365 miles per hour. Bluebird was a wreck, having taken off for nearly 300 yards before coming to Earth. Campbell escaped with only a fractured rib and a pierced eardrum. The experience had left its mark, although Campbell put on a characteristically brave face for the cameras. I have survived the fastest crash that uh, mankind has ever survived. A British industrialist, Sir Alfred Owen, paid for another bluebird to be built. This time the record attempt was made in Australia, at Lake Eyre, where heavy rain disrupted Campbell's plans. He was back again in 1964 with a smaller team. Money was tight and they lived off army rations. The preparations went ahead. But there was tension in the air and rumors were running around that Campbell had lost his nerve. He went for the record on the 17th of July. Tonya gave him his mascot, the teddy bear, Mr. Whoppet. On the outward run, the surface conditions made handling extremely difficult. But Campbell's speed was high enough to bring the record within his grasp. As the team worked on the turnaround, Campbell was grim-looking and unusually silent. Later, he told his daughter Gina that he had had a vision of his father, who told him that all would be well. And it was. Against all the odds, racing over a collapsing surface and battling with an overrunning engine and shredding tires, Campbell clocked 403 miles per hour. He had conquered the conditions, the car, and himself. The strain was etched on his face. Tonya's relief was plain to see.
On New Year's Eve at Lake Dumbleyung in Western Australia, Donald Campbell completed a unique double, smashing the water speed record at 276 miles per hour. He had broken both the land and water speed records in the course of a calendar year. Perhaps he should have stopped at this point. He had risked so much, and his statistical chances of survival were decreasing with each new record attempt. But the relentless round of finding new backers went on. Keeping up with technological demands was increasingly difficult. On land, the wheel-driven Bluebird was obsolete overtaken by Craig Breedlove's rocket-powered car, which the American eventually took through the 600-mile-per-hour barrier. Bluebird was beautiful, but now a back number to be trundled out of motor shows while Campbell's backers fell away. Campbell's marriage to Tonya Byrne was heading for the rocks. She could no longer endure having to play a secondary role to the other female in Donald's life, Bluebird. Campbell's superstitious nature led him towards spiritualism in an attempt to contact his father. Perhaps the prickly old hero would tell his son what to do. Fate drew Campbell back to the dark waters of Coniston. It's a pretty place when the sun shines, but bone-numbingly dank when the mist rolls down from the hills. Leo Villa was worried. He knew that Bluebird was past her best, but she slipped into the water again with a more powerful Orpheus engine. Then came the long, troubled wait for the record. In the past, Campbell had trained to escape a high-speed crash. It looked simple enough in the tank. But what would it be like if he hit trouble at over 300 miles per hour? As always, there was a wry smile for the cameras. The moment of truth arrived on the 4th of January, 1967. Bluebird was readied for the record attempt. The press hunched over their cameras. Campbell roared northward across the lake on his second run. Bluebird was well into her measured mile and within seconds of smashing the record. Divers went down to look for Donald Campbell's body. They never found it. The only survivor was the little teddy bear mascot, Mr. Wobbit. All his life, Donald Campbell had carried the burden of being his father's son. He had proved himself, but at an enormous cost, which was belied by his dashing manner. As the fatal run began, Campbell was a man beset by emotional and financial problems. Did these drive him either accidentally or deliberately to turn round too quickly. Attempts to insert a more powerful engine into Bluebird's aging hull had proved difficult and may have fatally altered her trim and balance.
Precisely what went wrong will never be known. But in those last moments, did Donald Campbell decide to take his own life? Or was this just one challenge too far?